set the call. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. I'd like to call the meeting of the Board of Education of St. Mary's County to order for April 8th, 2015. Could I please have a motion to move into executive session? I move the board enter into executive session for the purpose of personnel, collective bargaining or legal, property acquisition issues, and student issues under Maryland Local Government Code Article Section 9-512A, 1, 2, 6, and 10. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Karen, do you want this? I'll grab one from the back of okay. the wall. Ready to reconvene the open meeting at 914. Sorry for the delay. So, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, I would like to thank everyone for coming out today, all of our guests see throughout the room. Um, first on the agenda is approval of the agenda. I move uh, approval of the agenda as presented. Do I have a second? I second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to board reports. Ms. Sarita Lee. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have been working with students, student leaders from each of the high schools to plan the sa upcoming safety and security festivals. Um, so at these festivals, we've decided to distribute the fact sheet um, and other information from Walden and review that information and then talk about the takeaway items from the Youth Drug Prevention Summit. So what did these student leaders take away? What was their main uh, idea that they came out of the drug summit or the planning of the drug summit remembering. And then uh, the main part of these festivals is to provide that contact information for students to become more involved in uh, youth drug prevention um, for into next year. And so the contact information for myself as well as safety and security will be provided. And if they'd like to become, um, if students would like to become more involved with the safety and security meetings next year, then that will be one avenue of generating that interest. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Carthy? I've been learning all about conducting a political campaign. I'm getting ready for the next run and using the internet to do it because I've never used the internet. So that's, it's complicated, but it's interesting. So. Okay. Mrs. Weaver? Okay. Um, I've been to several events this, uh, over the last two weeks, but instead today, instead of uh, talking about those, I decided to take the opportunity to speak about autism. Um, April is Autism Awareness Month, and April 2nd was World Autism Awareness Day. Um, in 1911, a Swiss psychiatrist first coined the term autism, and then later in the 1940s, two other uh, doctors started describing the behaviors of autism, which was Leo Kanner and Hans Osberger. Um, the CDC has identified now as that, you know, as they've learned more about autism, one in 68 American children have the diagnosis of autism. And it's more prevalent in boys than it is in girls. It's four times more prevalent. Um, and currently, um, in St. Mary's County Public School, the, there's 180 students with the uh, diagnosis with the disability of autism. And they, these students have been identified and received services here in our schools. There's um, the St. Mary's County Public School does have an autism support team. And they are supported by, um, that's the teachers, therapists, psychologists, administrators, and instructional assistants that make up this team. There's also ABA, 
uh, which are the providers that work with these students to ensure that their their plans are carried through and um, these are people right there on the you know I guess on the ground floor there helping helping with the students but it takes a whole team to identify and to ensure that the services are carried through um, there's also specialized classes uh, that are are in the elementary middle and high schools and that these classes do meet the needs the complex needs of the students that have been diagnosed with the um, with autism for in the school many of these students are mainstream I would say most of the students are mainstream so the team also then would include you know the teachers um, you know just the regular ed teachers who are, are working with these students daily um, it doesn't just stop with the team that I've I've identified it also is that bus driver who starts that student stay out by picking them up because that can make or break them and I know that um, the paraeducators the regular ed teachers which I spoke about and the students themselves whether it's the uh, their fellow students you know you know befriending them and helping them with that social interaction and the students themselves working very hard to achieve their goals so um, like I said this is Autism Awareness Month and um, I personally like would like to thank those people that are, are there doing that every day you know like I said those bus drivers can make or break that student you know getting to school and you know and especially some of the teachers uh, that I've come across especially like Jason Kramer who was uh, a paraeducator and who is now a teacher wonderful Gary O'Neill, Marcy Huff, Miss Freeman, um, and like I said, I couldn't name the enormous amount of people that have made a significant impact in these students' lives. Thank you. All right, so with spring break, I think everyone's activities were a little abbreviated, but um, I would just like to compliment all of the staff and teachers during yesterday's blackout. Um, stories that came home were principals going down the hallway with flashlights because students were in classrooms without windows so they were pitched into utter darkness immediately um, you know my kids had a great time because the first graders and the second and the third graders got to pair up together um, I think it's one of the things that we don't that we don't realize you know that um, a lot of the staff and teachers in the schools are supplemental parents when the children are in their schools for eight or ten or however many hours that they are in each day and um, I'm sure there were some very trying moments I'm sure there were some very there were some tears and um, I think from the lack of any um, angry letters that the board has received from any parents I think that overall they held that um, <laughs> everyone held together very well so I just want to thank everyone across the whole system for everything they did that they did to do that. Absolutely. So thank you. It was it was kind of in some students I'm sure it was more of a non-event just because of the you know the cool, quick, steady thinking of all of our employees. So thank you. We had we had a hundred percent call in for all of our radios. Everybody everybody answered. We had radio calls throughout the entire day informing us that the power was off. We had a good communication network, even though we did not necessarily have the lights on. Right. And it's always great when Mechanicsville, Maryland makes the national news. <laughs> 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 For blowing up, like, what, the White House lights and the State Department and the Pentagon. So, great day. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, sorry, Mrs. Washington, oh, no, you're on. <laughs> great. That was wonderful. I attended the Great Mills High School National Honor Society oh, induction. It was a wonderful ceremony. Uh, to recognize the students for their achievements and also they did something differently they had it was held in the evening and they wanted to try that out to see if they could get more parents to come because that way they would not have to take off time for their jobs when it's being held in the daytime and it was a wonderful event and cake and punch was served at the end and congratulations to all the students who were inducted the students who remained in the Honor Society, and all the teachers and parents and everybody to help them to maintain their status. So thank you very much. 
Mrs. For the, Allen, you're on. For the fourth year in a row, White Marsh Elementary School held a school-wide science fair. Um, the uh, science projects for the third, fourth, and fifth grades were judged, and I had the opportunity, um, this is my third of four years as uh, judging the contest. The, um, the exhibits were uh, informative, they were interesting, and you could really see what the students had done and had learned from it. And so congratulations to all of the students who participated and to the teachers who undertook this um, quite daunting task. Uh, I, I know that it is their fourth year and they've learned something each year and, and they have streamlined and improved the process each of those years, um, but they're enthusiastic about it and, uh, and it shows in what comes out of the students. So. Um, Congratulations to all. Uh, just a few, sh uh, first of all, a shout out for Miss Ann Johnson. She's the intern liaison at the James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center, and she's being recognized April 28th by MSDE and receiving the 2015 Career and Technology Education Outstanding Change Agent Award of Excellence. Um, so congratulations to Miss Ann Johnson and, and all she does to uh, find internships and opportunities for uh, the, the students of St. Mary's County to really apply their, their learning directly in a, a, a work setting. Um, April is School Library Month as well, and so uh, this month recognizes the work of our school librarians and their programs. School libraries provide materials for students and teachers that not only encourage growth and knowledge, but also materials that will develop literary, cultural, aesthetic appreciation, and ethical standards. This year's theme is Your School Library Where Learning Never Ends. So please, students and parents, visit libraries, school libraries in particular. Uh, the last is just uh, making everybody aware, next Tuesday, April 14th, the St. Mary's County Commissioners will be holding their public hearing uh, on their recommended fiscal year 2015 budget at Great Mills High School beginning at 6.30 p.m. Um, I ask that we all come out to support education, our educators, and all our staff that supports students and uh, helps us have an, an, uh, such excellent facilities. So I look forward to seeing all of you next Tuesday. Thank you. Okay. Continuing right along. Uh, recognitions. April is Environmental Education Month and Mrs. Margarita Bracho. 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 Oh. I need like the little, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Phonetics, thank you. <laughs> My. Rock. <laughs> My maiden name's Ortuglio, so I can relate. Yes, so. <laughs> See if I can, is this good? Okay. I think I might need these. So I'd like to open by borrowing the first line of one of our most popular recorded phone messages. This is a message from the St. Mary's County Public Schools. The St. Mary's County Public Schools are open for environmental education. Spring has finally sprung, and as the last snow mountains recede from the big box store parking lots, it's natural that our thoughts turn to outdoor activities such as playing ball, gardening, boating, exploring the shorelines, roads, and trails of this peninsula, and environmental education. The governor has declared April as Environmental Education Month in Maryland, but in truth, environmental education happens all year round. This month, we take a snapshot to highlight some of the curriculum embedded environmental education lessons that go on throughout the year. Teachers will complete the last half of a professional development workshop on sustainable practices this Saturday by planning and planting a demonstration conservation garden just around the corner from this room using native plants grown by seventh graders in their ongoing student service learning program at the Elms Native Plant Nursery. Chris Davies social studies students from Great Mills just completed marking trails and clearing non-invasive, I'm sorry, clearing non-native invasive Phragmites at the Elms. Amanda Myatt's environmental science students at Chopticon will conduct biological surveys of the creek, woodlands, and fields at Sodderley this Friday using canoes, boot power, and test equipment that they will use if they pursue a career in the environmental sciences. 
Spring Ridge students in Ms. McLean Blevins' math class did calculations comparing the cost of reusable water bottles to disposable and found they could save $75 or more per year by using a reusable and then figured out how much they could save in their lifetime. They're using the kilowatt meters, using low kilowatt meters, you can just plug into the wall and then plug your appliance um, into it to track electricity usage by their smart boards and then determining the amount of energy and cost to the school that, they could, that could be saved by turning off the boards when the students are at lunch and at specials. And then in Mrs. Gavin's art class, they're creating signs with sayings to remind teachers and students to turn off the smart boards when they're not in use. In Leonardtown Elementary students are preparing for their overnight Elms trip next week, where they'll spend an unbroken 24 hours with the classmates they thought they knew pretty well. <laughs> they will sing for bay creatures. They'll debate a current environmental issue by studying and understanding a stakeholder's position that may or may not be their own. They'll expand the compassing skills that they learned in the fall by geocaching. They'll go on a night hike to identify frogs by their calls. And of course, they'll deny that that last soggy orphan sock or other small white article of clothing is theirs. These are just a sampling of the project-based hands-on learning activities that are going on during the month of April, which in turn is just a sample of the curriculum integrated environmental education lessons which go on in the classroom, on the school grounds, and at the Elms and Satterley field sites throughout the school year. So I encourage you to help our students learn about the environment in the environment by joining them at the Elms or Satterley or at their home school grounds and classroom this month and every month. And we have a proclamation from the governor. And actually, Ms. Rocco, I'm going to read it from here That's because the lighting is better. We drew straws to see who could. <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's very small. Uh, this is from the state of Maryland. It's a proclamation from the governor of the state of Maryland, uh, Environmental Education Month, April 2015. Whereas environmental education embraces appreciation of science, geography, history, economics, and government to develop positive attitudes and necessary skills to participate responsibly and environmentally responsibly in environmental decision making and whereas environmental education includes the interdisciplinary understanding of local, state, regional, national, and global environmental issues including air, water, and soil quality, human and environmental health and justice, biodiversity, habitat protection and restoration, land use, energy, sustainable development, and climate change, and whereas exploration and enjoyment of the outdoors both as part of a formal education program as well as an unstructured recreational activity is critical to understanding and protecting Maryland's natural resources and whereas environmental education continues to gain support from individuals, citizens, schools, higher education, nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and commercial enterprises as we face new and changing challenges, including the restoration of the Chesapeake Bay. Now, therefore, I, not me, I, Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., Governor of the State of Maryland, do hereby proclaim April 25th as Environmental Education Month throughout the state and urge all citizens to celebrate accomplishments, conduct special events, and plan future activities that will continue to bring high-quality environmental education programs to all of Maryland. And signed by Mr. Hogan, the Lieutenant Governor, and the Secretary of State. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rucka. Okay. April's a busy month. It's also the month of the military child and week of the young child. We have Ms. Kelly Hall and Ms. Cynthia Kilcoin. Kilcoin. There you go. She told my son, Cynthia Kilcoin. So that she sure looks young. She never aged. Also. Mm -hmm. yeah, it could. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to show you a movie in just one second. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here. 
We are very honored for the, um, April is the month of the military <laughs> child. We have our military liaison, Ms. Dawn Simpson, here with us today. And we have this banner from Pax River to hang to celebrate. We're gonna do a proclamation mm -hmm. in just a minute, but I wanna tell you a little bit about the month of the military child. Um, the month of the military child is a special national celebration and a proclamation that is a legacy of former Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger. And it was established to underscore the important role children play in the armed forces community. Our schools are recognizing and celebrating the military connected student population and their contributions and sacrifices. And we thought the best way to show that to you We've made a little video for you that we would like you to see, and I would be remiss if I did not thank Lauren and Avery, who work very closely with Marianne Williams at the Tech Center. So I'm going to start this video. And Ms. Short, if you would turn off the lights, please. You stand. April is the month of the military child. The St. Mary's County Public School System has one of the largest military enrollments in the country with over 5,000 military-connected students. SMCPS is proud of our relationship with the military community and thanks them for their service. Turn the lights back on. Thank you, Ms. Short. Um, Mr. Smith, if you could join me, please. We have a proclamation. And I want to let everyone know that every school is going to recognize the month of the military child on their marquee. April 15th is the military purple up, where we dress in purple to signify the importance of the military community and the contributions our students make as military children. And obviously, the purple is red, white, and blue together makes purple, which many of our favorite colors. So everybody, we're asking everyone to wear purple on April the 15th, and it'll be on the school websites, and the kids will really be encouraged. Um, Ms. Dawn Simpson, could I ask you to please come up here with Mr. Smith? Thank you. Ms. Simpson, how good to see you this morning. I have a resolution for you from the Board of Education of St. Mary's County for this day, Wednesday 8, 2015, for the month of the military child, April. Whereas, a lot of those whereas is today, whereas thousands of Americans have demonstrated their patriotism and commitment to freedom <laughs> by serving in and for, <clears throat> excuse me, our U.S. Armed Services, and whereas we are more than 5,000 military-connected children and youth that attend St. Mary's County Public Schools, and 
whereas military connected family and youth continue to make momentous contributions to family, schools, communities, the nation, our state, St. Mary's County, and whereas these children are a source of pride and honor to us all and it is only fitting that we take time to let them know they are valued and supported and recognize that military connected serve too. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of St. Mary's County does hereby proclaim April as the month of the military child in St. Mary's County Public Schools and the community. All school and staff are encouraged to recognize this month as the month of the military child with appropriate ceremonies and activities that honor, support, and thank military-connected families. Signed on this eighth day of April, 2015, by all of the board members. Thank you. Would you like to? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing prepared, but I'm sure I can. <laughs> Good, morning. Um, Good morning. I'd like to thank you, um, members of the board, Mr. Smith, and of course, Ms. Hall, for all of your efforts in recognizing April as the month of the military child, and certainly to our teachers and principals and staff throughout the school system for all that they do, uh, not only this month, but throughout the year to support our military children. You could hear from the video with the Military Child's Creed that they do make sacrifices and they do serve alongside their family, so it is fitting that we take time to recognize them for the sacrifices that they make um, as a military child. But yet, it's wonderful to be able to welcome them to this community and know that they will receive quality education and care from the school system across the board, no matter where they're enrolled. And that allows our service members to remain focused on their mission when they know that their children are being well cared for. That's one less thing that they have to worry about. And I have the wonderful privilege of being able to reassure them of that as they're inbound to Pax River. So again, thank you for all that you do, not only this month, but throughout the year to support our military families and especially our children. We're purple. And we're purple. <laughs> okay, also in April, we have the Week of the Young Child, and it's an annual celebration sponsored by the National Association for the Education of Young Children and the purpose of the Week of the Young Child is to focus public attention on the needs of young children and their families and to recognize the early childhood programs and services that meet those needs. And we have another video. We thought it would be much more efficient to bring the schools to you. So you will see in this video an assortment of our early childhood programs that we're very proud of, Head Start and Pre-K, Preschool Special Education, Kindergarten. And you're going to see about six different elementary schools represented during this video. So, without further ado. This is the one I want. Ready? Mm -hmm. April 12th through the 18th is the Week of the Young Child. The Week of the Young Child is an annual celebration sponsored by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. The purpose of the Week of the Young Child is to focus public attention on the needs of young children and their families, and to recognize the early childhood programs and services that meet those needs. In St. Mary's County, there are 17 elementary schools that serve pre-K to 5, and one public charter school that serves grades K through 8. <coughs> this year, early education teachers have been given time to meet together to discuss better strategies to help children and their families. Our professional learning community time is valuable to us because it allows pre-kindergarten team to meet together, discuss our students' needs, and allows us to come up with strategies to implement in our classroom to benefit our students. Yeah. CPS also provides several programs to assist in early education, such as Head Start and Judy Center. The Head Start program provides services for children ages three through five and their families. The focus is to provide a learning environment and comprehensive services that supports children's growth. The Judy Center provides services such as vision, hearing, and dental screenings to ensure that children first through kindergarten are socially, emotionally, and physically ready for school. Currently, we're serving 673 children and family. All of our services are free, and our goal is school readiness, to ensure that children are entering school ready to learn. It's important because it helps us to um, instill school readiness skills into the children and also the providers and for them to understand that they're, they're working in partnership with their parents as their children's first teachers. St. Mary's County Public Schools recognizes the importance of early childhood education. 
how that will affect these children growing up. They are dedicated to finding new ways to make these students successful. For more information about these programs, visit smcps.org. So I'm going to ask Mr. Smith to join me again, please, at, at the podium. We have a proclamation. And I'm going to ask Mrs. Cynthia Kilcoin, our coordinating supervisor of early childhood programs, both general education and special education, to also join us. And as Ms. Kilcoin is <clears throat> excuse me, as Ms. Kilcoin is making her way here, one of the reasons that we have created videos for both of these events is that we are going to be, we post them obviously to the school system website. We're going to tweet them out. We want to get as many views as possible so people can see the fantastic commitment to our military as well as the fantastic programs for our elementary or for our early childhood children. So this is a resolution from the Board of Education from St. Mary's County for Wednesday, April 8th, Week of the Young Child. Whereas April 12th through the 18th, 2015 has been designated as Week of the Young Child and whereas the importance of children's earliest years in shaping their learning and development is acknowledged and whereas we recognize that building better futures for all children is a community responsibility and recommit ourselves to ensuring that each and every child experiences the type of early education at home at school at child care and in the community that will promote their early learning now therefore be it resolved that the board of education of st mary's county endorses the observance of the week of the young child as an opportunity to join other government agencies, community-based organizations, service groups, and private citizens in committing to ensuring that every young child in St. Mary's County has the best possible early childhood experience and lives in a community that values and supports each child and family. And it's signed on this day by the Board of Education. And I present it to you. Thank you. As Mr. Smith referenced, those videos will be posted to the YouTube site momentarily. Mrs. Simpson, we have a DVD for your review as well for you to share. Thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to highlight these special events in the month of April. Okay. We are now going to take a short break according to the agenda um, to greet everyone here. So we will reconvene at 10 o'clock. Board of Education. Oh, yes. <laughs> Public hearing, we have none. Public comment. Yes. One, okay. Nice. Item here. All right. The board welcomes public input on policies and issues affecting our schools. The board takes this time to listen and consider, but not to comment. This is not, however, the appropriate forum for negative comments or criticisms of individual staff or students. Concerns about individual staff members that cannot be resolved at the level closest to the situation should be directed to the superintendent. This board will not permit comments criticizing individual staff or students since this is outside the scope of public comment. Additionally, the board sits as an appellate body in both student and employee appeals. The board cannot comment on or have prior knowledge of a case that would influence their ability to deliberate. To maintain the ability of the board to render a fair and unbiased decision, comments regarding individual student or personnel issues cannot be presented at public comment. Speakers must sign in at the beginning of the meeting. Public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker, and speakers may not yield their time to someone else. The board encourages speakers to present written statements to the board secretary, who will distribute copies to all board members. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Better crowd than the last time I was here. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, today, uh, we are going to sign a contract for the current school year, finally closing the book on the unfortunate situation brought about by last year's deficit. We're forging a new relationship and working together for the good of our public schools. Throughout all the angst and the ugly, the staff continue to deliver a quality education and throughout this year they continue to work hard for our kids. Even this morning, 
you heard that it requires specialized teams to provide programs for our uh, kids who have disabilities. We heard about the empathy and patience that, it, that go into action right away when an emergency like the lights going out happens. We heard about the honor society, the science fair, the Saturday planting and the overnight trips that all require teachers to give of their personal time when they could be home with their own families. We heard about the teacher who was going to receive an outstanding achievement award. This is a great place for kids to grow up. This is a great school system. So now we hope that everyone will come together to rebuild the trust and reorganize <clears throat> our uh, group and that that we will recognize the great people that we have here in St. Mary's County and show appreciation for their dedication. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda. I move approval of the consent agenda consisting of uh, the minutes of March 25th, 2015, personnel, teachers, and performance matters. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next on the agenda is the communication tower. This is Kimberly Howe and Mr. Brad Clements. Good morning. Um, with us also today um, from the county government is Mr. Bob Kelly, Information and Technology yeah. Director. Um, what we're here today to talk about is a 911 communications tower. We've been um, before you before to talk about this item. And we're at the point now where we have worked um, with Mr. Sparling, the county attorney, and our attorney, and we are before you today for the approval of the lease. Um, St. Mary's County um, government has been working um, on this project for a while and the commissioners of St. Mary's County have a capital improvements project for 13 transmission towers in total. Um, in FY15, they have a project for the final phase, which includes seven of the um, 13 towers. They approved a contract award for these um, 13 towers for the seven um, remaining on June 29th in 2012. The tower that we're talking about would be on the Leonardtown campus, which is Leonardtown High School, the Dr. James A. Forrest Career and Technology Center, Fairlead Academy II, and Leonardtown Middle School. The proposed location um, that was chosen um, was based on the ability for the signal um, capability to provide 911 communication coverage for the Breton Bay area, Medley's Neck, Potomac River shoreline down to Piney Point area. Um, it was chosen due to the signal capabilities and the broadcast area and a little farther in the presentation I'm going to show you some coverage maps that will show you that. Um, several sites on the campus have been reviewed by staff and consultants and with the board and they've done their due diligence in being able to make sure that our needs are met as well as meeting the communication tower needs. Um, the tower that I do have here um, is one um, that will be very, it will be the similar tower that we're building. Um, on the site, um, the county is, and this is the one that is at the Valley Lee um, Convenience Center. Uh, the need for this tower is clearly demonstrated by the um, map that has been provided on the left in the blue, and that is the current coverage of the 911 communications that is present there. Mm -hmm. um, the blue shows the coverage, and where you see white, that is where um, there is um, lapses in the coverage for the 911 communications. The map on the right in green shows the location of the 13 proposed towers and the coverage after. And as you can see, um, with uh, the overlapping, there is coverage um, throughout the entire county and out into the water. So um, this will give um, very good effective communication um, once completed. The terms of um, where we are with the tower, the consultant has completed and determined the placement um, along a ridge behind Leonardtown Middle School, Fairlead Academy, and Leonardtown High School to be a viable location. Um, working with Mr. Kelly and the consultants, considerable time was spent out in the woods looking at options. We um, did present those options to the board um, as information over time, looking at the best possible location for that and looking at how our educational needs would be met 
um, especially in terms of expansion of our facility for Leonardtown High School in the future for potential athletic fields to be met. Um, what we have decided is based on this potential um, location, the athletic fields would still be able to be expanded um, and this would meet the needs of the 911 communication. So it would be in the woods located behind these three facilities. The lease specifics um, have been reviewed by both attorneys. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about indemnification because this is a three-party contract. There's a contract that exists between the county and Harris Corporation, which is the um, entity that will be constructing um, the tower. So they have a contract which becomes part of our contract. So we made sure that their um, indemnity clause that they have um, meets our needs and that we did add and strengthen our indemnity clause in our contract. Um, we talked a lot in the terms of the contract about shared use of facilities um, and then we talked a lot about the length of the lease and, and shared use um, as we continue on. So the actual specifics of the lease, it would be a 50-year lease um, starting May 1st and expiring May 30th, 2065 and then from there on there would be automatic five-year extensions um, with everyone agreeing to those five-year extensions. We did as we did with the Marymount um, McLeod Bethune Tower that we have um, in partnership with the county. We did agree to a third party rental income for the school system at this time um, because it is a 911 communication tower. The county is not pursuing that option, but in the event that they do um, pursue that option, we would get third party rental income if any um, other um, commercial entities were to hang communication um, off of the tower. The acreage involved is 0.477 acres, so it's less than one acre and under public school construction um, procedures. It does not require formal um, approval from the state, but what we will do is once approved by the Board of Education and the County Commissioners, we will forward it up um, to them just as a courtesy. The actual tower is 350 foot tall, self-supporting, solid-legged um, communication tower. The shelter will be 11 feet by 6, 11 um, feet 6 inches by 24 inf um, feet communication shelter. The actual compound will be 100 foot by 100 foot. It'll have an internal backup generator and fuel storage container, security fence, and a gravel access road. Um, we worked very closely with um, county government and knowing that the wood um, area is also used by Leonardtown High School for their cross-country track, um, what we did negotiate is that the um, actual um, padded area for the structure and the shelter will be exclusive rights to the county for their use. The gravel access road will be non-exclusive and we will maintain access to that on a regular basis. The easement area um, is the shelter and compound down here, show where the tower is and the access road. Um, the access road will be um, accessed primarily right from behind Fairlead Academy. Um, one of the things that we do know is that we have a project in for Fairlead Academy and what we have worked out is that at the entrance point it comes off of the back parking lot of Fairlead. In the event that we need to alter that in any way as we expand Fairlead Academy, that will be included in our project and we will maintain the access for um, the tower. It then goes into the woods um, and rides our property line back to the tower. Um, Evidenced on the right is the compound area, which is the 100 foot by 100 foot. They will have exclusive rights to that. Everything else we will maintain our rights to and can still use on a regular basis. Um, in working with Mr. Kelly, we knew that um, everyone would want to have a perspective of what the tower would look like under construction. So he worked with the um, company, um, Harris Corporation, and they were able to give us some perspectives of what it would look like from three vantage points. Um, so this is what the tower would look like from the stadium area at Leonardtown High School. From the parking lot at the Forest Center. And from the entrance drive coming in on um, 244 at Leonardtown Middle School. Um, in terms of where we would proceed next, if approved by the Board of Education, it would be proceeding on to the County Commissioners for their approval at their meeting next week. Um, in terms of construction, um, Mr. Kelly has indicated that if approved by both entities, the contractor is scheduled to start with clearing of the woods in mid-May and construction would be completed in September of 2015. And if you have any questions, Mr. Kelly or I would be glad to answer them. So reading. 
questions? Um, you're talking about how the, the existing, the cross country team uses the, uh, the trails. Is the, are the trails going to be used as the access road? Like, is any part of that going to like overlap or? In talking to um, the athletic director, um, there should be um, really at this point no impact. Um, if there is any impact to the trails, Mr. Kelly and I have talked about how that might be addressed. Um, but at this point, there should be no impact to the, to the cross country trail. It should be able to be maintained. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Crosby. It looks very good to me, and it, I believe it's very important to cover a whole area, not splotches. You certainly know when you're talking to your friend on the phone and all of a sudden they're not there, and then later they're there. So that's good. That, and you've done a good job. You always do a good job. Thank you. Okay. Um, what is the school's liability with the upkeep and the road maintenance then for going to the tower? The um, road maintenance um, will be part of the um, county's responsibility to maintain the road. Okay. What about like with the tower and upkeep? That's the tower, with the, the tower, that's and everything that's associated within the compound is responsibility of the county. For any purposes other than an absolute emergency, um, the county will have exclusive rights to the tower and should be maintaining everything within the, the compound area. All right. Thank you. Mrs. Washington. The 911 communication towers are essential to protect people, places, and things. And the way it is now, it's been spotty, but it needs to cover the whole county, which this brings forward. Mm -hmm. And after you considered many locations, it was determined that this was the best location. You took the best interest of the students into consideration, and the woods behind Leonardtown High School was the best to provide mm -hmm. coverage for those areas. And it won't compromise fairly the academy if we expand it or the athletic fields if we do that too. So I think, and the construction's going to take place starting in May, and it should be done when school opens, so that's a good thing too. So I think you've taken into a lot of consideration and this will work well for the county and for the school system as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, negotiating the, um, the third party rental income. Um, I know the conversation was that uh, that's not likely to happen, but I, I think it's a good provision to have in there. Um, this uh, agreement <coughs> mirrors the one that we have um, uh, for our other site. Um, I also appreciate the correction and dates that was on there. Um, I am interested to understand, at one time the conversation was that the access to this would be from Medley Neck Road, and now we've gone back to um, from the complex. Um, can you shed some light on that? Um, when we originally started, we were looking at an access off of Medley's Neck Road, um, and in doing the due diligence um, of looking at all of the sites, um, when the engineers went out, um, there were some topography issues, um, and trying to get to that site um, presented a significant challenge. Um, in addition, that would have put it closer to the athletic fields as well. So there was a couple of compounding factors that would have presented issues. Um, so when we went out and revisited that, this is how we eventually got to this point. There are several ridges out on the, that area. Um, particularly the problem with Route 244 was going to be the, the crossing trying to get to the, to the access road. To get over. Well, the tower is definitely needed. I think it's a good placement for it. Um, I've been um, at a farm out that way and you, up to this time, if you called 911 from that farm on a cell phone, you got Virginia. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's past time to put this in place. So thank you very much for negotiating it, and um, we move forward. And it starts May 1st, is that, or construction will? Mid-May. Mid-May, mid okay. Right. And um, one of the things I should have also said is the contractor has already completed three of the um, seven, so there is a track record to, to show um, the ability to complete the tower. So this would be the fourth. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone have anything else? No. Okay. I would like a motion to <coughs> the communication, the lease agreement. I move that the Board of Education of St. Mary's County approve contract ITB SMCPS 215. 
Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm way ahead. Okay. I said, that's done. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Sorry. Like, whoa. You just gave everyone over there a heart attack by over there. Oh, today. no. I guess this, what's that? I'm going, okay. Where I'm so that? sorry. <laughs> The, I move that the Board of Education approve the lease agreement with the commissioners for St. Mary's County for the construction of a communications tower and associated facilities for public safety communications as presented by staff. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Now, oh. clearly where Mary wants to go is to the contract for arsenic so filtration <laughs> removal system. <laughs> oh, thank you, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all squished together. So you're yeah, okay. Well, that, was, that was an easy one. That, that was. I do that all the time. You're on. Hello. Uh -huh. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. I'm here today um, to uh, ask the board's approval to uh, approve the purchase of an arsenic filtration system for Benjamin Banneker Elementary School. First, to give you some information on the arsenic, uh, arsenic occurs naturally in groundwater sources and is part uh, is a result of changes in the geology, and it releases arsenic from uh, iron oxide. Arsenic levels in drinking water are regulated um, at the federal level by the EPA, but at the Maryland level by MDE or the Mar Maryland Department of the Environment at 10 parts per billion or less. Um, in 2010, MDE required that we begin monitoring. This is at Benjamin Banneker uh, Early Childhood Center. Okay. In 2010, they required we begin monitoring on a monthly basis. And at the time we first started monitoring, levels were at 8.5 parts per billion. <clears throat> and at that time, I uh, included in a future budget request to, to start doing some reaction to the levels. Options were investigated and um, to remedy the situation, including filtration removal of the arsenic or the installation or replacement of the existing well uh, with a deeper well um, to a different aquifer, of course. The filtration uh, removal option was based on the cost feasibility, the uh, cost sustainability over time. Additionally, there's no certainty or guarantee that the deep aquifer will be free of arsenic as time goes on. Uh, Arsenic filtration was installed. This is a smaller unit than the one I'm asking for permission today to purchase. Uh, and the cost for startup was the, for the design, the delivery, and the startup was $20,575. Uh, we contracted a little bit of installation assistance from a local plumbing contractor at $995. And the ongoing maintenance is about $125 a year. The actual maintenance doesn't occur, but every three and a half to five years but it's about $125 a year if you average it out, compared with an approximate cost of about $90,000 to drill a, a new well, about 400 to 500 foot deeper than the current well, with no guarantee of a lower arsenic level once we got there. The current installation, I it just, um, it, it's, the system is actually relatively simple. It's two tanks. The, the main cost is the controller and the media, or the, um, Iron oxide is actually used to remove the arsenic back out of the water. That's where it's released from geologically, and that's how it's reabsorbed. It's an iron ferry. And then um, the controller and the piping, and this is the main supply to the building, and we tapped into it. And um, we recently did, um, uh, before I brought this to the board, of course, I did. we did arsenic level tests after this was tested. And the results were what they call absent, which means it was below the detection level of the test. Um, Benjamin Banneker Elementary School, this is uh, Big Ben as we refer to it. Um, they are on two separate wells. Uh, they're not a common well. So in 2012, MDE required that we start monitoring this well, and initially uh, levels were detected at 9.5 parts per billion. Shortly after, they dropped off to 8 parts per billion. Current levels, uh, we've monitored monthly since then and have creeped up to about 9.8 uh, parts per billion at 10 is no longer suitable for consumption. Uh, the estimated replacement cost for a deeper well at this project was about $120,000, uh, slightly more than a uh, little bit because of the size of the well and the gallons per minute. With no guarantee, again, no guarantee of a lower arsenic level going into the future. So we, uh, 
the procurement method we used was an invitation to bid, um, as outlined in the board policy. And the arsenic filtration removal was advertised on uh, February uh, 10th, 2015, on email or marketplace. Uh, bids were received from one supplier on February 25th, 2015. 105 suppliers were invited to bid. Only one chose to. And I do have a little bit of additional information on that. When we bid the first time for the smaller system, we received questions from about five different vendors. <clears throat> and it appears in the industry that a large number of the vendors take care of large installations. I mean, a public utility large type of installations. And the, the rest of the vendors design um, installations for small users, residential, and such. So this, this company, AdEdge, uh, actually appears to have had a, a niche in that. The only, plus, arsenic uh, appears, from the reading I've done, to only be an issue in uh, this part of the country, the southeast, and then in Washington State. And Washington State's issues are from Mount St. Helens and the, the, the unique geology in that area. Uh, the bid tab, only one price was returned. It's uh, 45869 for the uh, design, uh, construction, and delivery of the product, $4,130 for the startup fee, and uh, for a total of $49,999. The Department of Maintenance is seeking uh, the approval from the Board of Ec Education for contract ITB SMCPS 2015 M-ARS for the design, manufacturing, delivery, and startup services for an arsenic filtration removal system at Benjamin Banneker Elementary School to add edge uh, water technologies LLC in the amount of $49,900. Did you have any questions? Oops, sorry. sorry. No questions. Thank you. Mrs. Crosby? No, I don't. Thank you. Ms. Um, the 9.8, was that the latest reading? Because I know it came, we had seen this before, and then it was taken back off waiting for the latest reading. Is that the? Yeah, what happened was on the original installation, I, I of course didn't want to come to you and say we've installed one already and it doesn't work. What happened was the in, initial installation, um, I, I, I'd go back to the picture very quickly if I could, but it'd probably take too long. There's a flow orifice in there and it was shipped with the wrong one. It was too small. So we weren't getting quite the flow through the filtration, so okay. our levels weren't dropping significantly. Okay. So now they're down below detection levels, which is below four and a half parts per billion from 9.8. Okay. So yeah, I didn't want to come up here and tell you. <laughs> so. Okay, so everything's working good with yes. the filtration that's on at Little Ben. Yes. Um, when you, it is going to be installed, how will that affect the drinking water for the staff and students that are currently there, will it, or is it going to be done at a time when they are not? We'll, we'll probably schedule the installation over a long weekend. Typically, it takes about a day, day and a half, and then we have to sanitize the system. Right. Sanitization takes about six to twelve hours, and the testing takes about twelve hours after that. Okay. So, so we'll schedule it, and hopefully, it'll be before the end of the school year. If need be, we'll wait till they're out. And when we do work like that, we do deliver drinking water. The only thing we can't use the water for during that period is drinking. They can still use the um, restroom facilities and um, food service. Um, we can't. We can do that off-site, but we 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 choose not to do that. So we will schedule it around the kids being in there. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My only question is regarding um, at Edge Water Technologies. Um, any due diligence or background on that company? Yes. They, okay. Yes, and they've had very good reviews. Actually, they installed a system at um, uh, a couple of the power plants in the area. Okay. So they've done larger installations also. Okay. Okay. Mrs. Washington? Okay. Uh, based on what you told us, arsenic is naturally occurring from geological changes, and we can't prevent it, but we can monitor it. So di digging the deeper well, and would not guarantee that no arsenic will be there. And it may not occur in the future, even if you dug a deeper well. So we have to be fiscally responsible with the resources that we have. So it would be best, and at the same time, while keeping the students safe, yes, okay, <laughs> that it would be prudent to uh, monitor the system on a frequent basis and to do this at a time where it's not disruptive to the learning process. So um, thank you for all your research, and <coughs> most of my questions were answered right in your presentation. Thank you.
we will continue to monitor once a month regardless yeah. from here uh, on out for right. both systems. So. Correct. Thank you. Uh, for the installation at Little Ben, you uh, had a, a outside plumber come in to assist with that. Um, you don't have that accounted for in this. Do you anticipate that our staff will be able to install the unit um, without without any additional assistance? We are hopeful, yes. The, the location is a lot more accessible and the pipe is a lot larger, mm -hmm. so there's a lot less um, uh, chance of failure. We called in the outside plumber because of how the pipes were located against the wall and how close they were. We weren't uh, extremely confident that we could do that in-house without rupturing the pipe because of the, they're very small. The ones at Big Ben, the ones at uh, Little Ben were like four inch pipes and the ones at Big Ben are six inch pipes. It's a lot easier to work with actually. Okay. Um, and uh, this is not the only place in the county where we have schools with welds. How often is this testing done at our other schools? Monthly. Okay. Uh, MDE directs when we start testing. The rest of them uh, that we are not directed to get tested, we test annually. With when we do lead and copper testing, we do those at the same time. Uh, Chopticon is, uh, we just got a letter from MDE about a month and a half ago that we need to start monitoring at Chopticon. The balance of the ones, uh, to my knowledge, uh, about nine years ago were retapped to a lower aquifer. Mm -hmm. Uh, those um, are showing small signs of arsenic already, and um, I, I, I do every year I read the Maryland General Assembly's report on the Patapsco Aquifer, which is the lower one that we're they're currently tapping into and the status of it, and it, um, they are reporting uh, level changes and uh, by um, chemistry changes in that also. So okay. at, the, at the time, I, I would like to mention at the time about eight years ago when they did they retapped all these wells, the other ones of Hollywood, Oakville, was, there were several. It, Filtration was not an option. The, the upkeep was just tremendously expensive, but the technology has progressed in the past eight years. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Can I have a motion? Mary. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> then you want me to? Uh, you want me to? Okay, I will do it next. I was so Don't eager help. to do it. I move that the Board of Education of St. Mary's County approve contract ITB SMCPS 2015 MARS for the design, manufacturing, delivery, and startup services of an arsenic filtration removal system at Benjamin Banneker Elementary School to Add Edge Water Technologies LLC in the amount of $49,999. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Rita. <laughs> Opposed? <You're most> welcome. <laughs> Motion carried. Thank you. All right. More furniture purchase. Come on up. <laughs> Mr. Hartwick. <coughs> See what Springwich Middle School is going to get now. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this agenda item is similar to the agenda item we presented at the last board meeting uh, whereby you gave approval for us to use the Baltimore Regional Cooperative Purchase Committee contract for student desk. Um, as, as noted in that presentation, this particular contract really functions as a statewide contract. Uh, uh, many state agencies and LEAs throughout the state utilize it, and the pricing that we receive is reflective of, um, of this usage. Uh, the, the last extension um, of this contract is through December of 2015. I just want to note that uh, Ms. Mayo and Fiscal Services will be participating as a committee member uh, when this contract is rebid. Uh, so today we're requesting your approval to use the contract for the purchase of student chairs and science tables. For the student chairs, we looked at a number of, um, a couple options, uh, chairs manufactured by Verco and Arco Bell. Uh, we looked at both manufacturers uh, uh, have a similar chair in terms of, of design and the way the chairs are constructed. 
In this case, the discovery chair manufactured by Arco Bell was significantly less than uh, the Zuma chair uh, manufactured by, by Virco. The price differential was about $25 uh, per chair. Um, I'll say that Arco Bell is a well-established uh, manufacturer uh, over the years. Um, uh, they won a reputation for their quality, but they were recently purchased by the Han Group, which is a commercial furniture uh, manufacturer. And I think Arco Bell is really stepping up their marketing uh, uh, and pricing, uh, and that may explain somewhat that, that differential. The science tables are manufactured by Allied Plastics. Uh, we noted in the agenda that these particular tables have a 30-year warranty, uh, which, uh, to my knowledge, is, is the longest in the industry. Uh, these tables are extremely well made and comparable to laboratory tables that we have purchased previously. Again, there's a pretty significant price differential uh, between these tables at $558 per table. Uh, to those uh, of Campbell Ray, who is supplying the laboratory casework for Spring Ridge uh, Middle School as part of the contract. Um, when we talk to the science teachers about uh, their desires and their needs, um, understand that these tables are, are very heavy, uh, and so they ask for these tables to be placed on lock and casters. Uh, so we will be doing that so that they can be more, they'll have more flexibility in the way these rooms are set up. And it's also uh, an advantage to the building service staff to be able to have those, those tables on casters as well. Uh, the bids for both Arco Bell and Allied Plastics were awarded to Glover. Uh, Glover has had a long history of supplying furniture and equipment. St. Mary's County Public School, probably well over 30 years of experience. Uh, I, we used them at Leonardtown Middle School and Evergreen Elementary School, uh, and they performed well on those projects. Based on the volume of the student chairs, um, Glover provided a, uh, an additional discount above the 48.1% that uh, is required by the contract. They ended up giving us about 55% off on these chairs and that added to uh, additional savings, about $3,000 uh, for, uh, for this phase. So we are requesting today the use of the Baltimore Regional um, Cooperative Contract 2008-1 uh, for phase two furniture purchases from Glover in the amount of $26,634.98. So with that, I'll take your question. Mm -hmm. Sarita? No question, thank you. Mrs. Crosby? You did a really good job of saving us money. They must love you, that 50% discount. <laughs> My goodness sakes. Yes, very good. Thank you. And good furniture. It is good furniture. Mrs. Weaver? Will this not complete everything that we needed for the uh, Spring Ridge Middle School uh, extension or renovation? Uh, no, this is just phase two. Uh, okay. It does complete everything for phase two with the exception of the technology. I'm working with Mr. Howard on how to procure the technology, the smart boards for phase two. So we will be bringing these kinds of items to you again uh, okay. as, as the project progresses. Um, and um, like I say, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good contract for us. All right, thank you. Very thorough presentation, and you have any questions as I went through it, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Washington? This was very good, especially the price. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very good. And it's a well-respected company. They have quality workmanship, <laughs> the longest warranty, and the best price, so we can't go wrong with that. Thank you. Mrs. Allen? The majority of my questions were answered within your presentation. My only question for you is uh, with respect to the tables being placed on casters, um, the, will the height of the will the manufacturer adjust the height of the table so that when the casters are included that the height of the table doesn't change because that will impact the um, the way yes. the chair fits up yes. against it. They will. Okay. They, they will make that adjustment. Great. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? All right. I'm seeking a motion for the purchase of furniture. I recommend the Board of Education approve the use of the Baltimore Regional Cooperative Purchasing Committee's bid number 2008-01 
with the Glover for student chairs and science table at Spring Ridge Middle School in the amount of $26,634.98. Do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carried. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. All right, Mr. Clements, approval of the negotiated agreements. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. As Mrs. Uh, Laughlin in uh, public comment announced and talked about, uh, this uh, FY15 contract has been in the process for about uh, 15 to 18 months. And today I will be going over um, not all the changes. There was a number of grammatical and formatting changes. Um, as you go through the contract year after year and you're changing certain things, um, they seem to get out of format and on, so a lot of effort went into it this year to get that straight. Um, but there is a great number of things that we went through, and I want to try to walk you through those at this time. The, um, I do want to just recognize the teams. Um, the ASMIC team, Peg Johnson, I think she just came in with this. Um, uh, Trish Barietzi, I saw her come in there at the minute. Steve Wolf, uh, part of the ASMIC, Anna Laughlin of course, and Ms. Uh, Liz Purcell Luskin as the chief negotiator, you know, uh, representative on there. The seismic team, Christine Mattingly, um, uh, Gabriel McFadden, I don't think she's here, uh, Pat Davison and Faith Abernathy, and of course Liz as well on the, the two teams. And um, we did meet with uh, both teams at the same time when we were negotiating and continuing in FY16 that way. Um, as part of it, uh, myself as the chief negotiator, Mr. Dale Farrell as a member on there, Tammy McCourt as the member, uh, Mr. O'Mealy for legal counsel, and Kathy Mancini, who's here as well, um, took care of a lot of the recording and um, the document, keeps the documents back and forth between us. Um, greatly appreciated. Um, as I start through, um, both of the contracts were taken to ratification by um, each, each association and has approved it for it to come to you today. And so I just, you know, touch base on the general of these and not go through word by word, but um, there was a great desire that um, the CPI training, um, that uh, if someone wants that, can work through the site administrator and provide that, and that's truly important. And, we probably can't have too many in a school, so anyone willing to do that, we're more than going to accommodate and help them get through that and the recertification and also um, that was a, a very positive thing for both sides to be able to do that. Um, except in the case of an emergency, um, faculty meetings would not be held, um, uh, would not be regularly scheduled beyond the duty day on a Friday or before a holiday. Um, this is our practice. Many of these things is just trying to put them in, uh, into writing so that everyone is working by the same rules and understandings of that. Our paraeducators um, utilizing our electronic absent reporting system. Again, this is the process we're using. Uh, it's just uh, documented there as well in, in both contracts. Um, this item is new. I just. Um, it's, you can see at the top if they're new or it's an added to, and I'll point that out as well. But in both contracts, uh, student taping or videoing with their cell phones uh, and other devices in a classroom, um, if this is, um, you know, reported to the, the school administration, then they're going to take the appropriate action uh, with that, with the student um, code of conduct and everything, do the investigation and then follow through. Um, revision to easement. This is the acquired hours um, language. It was already an easement. Uh, you see the one change, uh, the 21 hours. It was previously 16, and um, the 21 brings it to seven hour workday, three days. Um, so an easement. Uh, it was just that change, and seismic did not have this language, and this language was added completely to seismic uh, for the exempt employees 
and there's um, a half a dozen or more of those employees, this would provide them, and they're 12 month employees, this would provide them the same opportunity uh, as um, our other uh, employees that aren't entitled to overtime and all of that. The um, salary, uh, it's just noting that uh, there were no steps in place this year, either at the beginning or mid year, and that we were staying at the 1314 uh, level and that there's also no COLA uh, offered this year. The um, survivor benefits, this um, is allowing that if a uh, active employee, um, there's someone on their plan, has been listed on their plan, and this person was uh, uh, to die during active service, they could continue or join, rejoin the plan um, within three years, and the three years aligns it with what we did with um, uh, retirees. It used to be prior um, contracts that um, an employee had to take our insurance into retirement or they couldn't get it. We agreed before to uh, allow them to um, opt to take it within three years. That way it really saved us money. They weren't having to take it into retirement to find out if they needed it or not, um, and which was the cost of the school system and the employee. Um, at that time, we felt three years was a, a, a comfortable time for someone retiring to understand where they, what their needs are. Um, this one, um, there was a question that you had regarding um, the split um, of employees, and Mrs. Luskin and I have spoke um, just before the meeting, and we'll work out that language to understand that um, it's, it's an active employee, so they're getting using the employee rates of percentage cut, and at some point they would move to the retirement one, and we'll work out that. I think we can work that out and understand that. <clears throat> the association's rights to placing in the hiring package, so this is the association will provide our new employees, um, and this is for seismic. Eismic has this similar language, um, so they'll get a packet and they'll also get the, um, the information about the, um, being the exclusive negotiating <coughs> representation and everything, their option to opt out and everything uh, on that regarding the fair share and everything. Um, this is sort of a next step in that we established the um, new staff orientations for seismic that has um, taken place uh, last year, this year and helping provide a lot of opportunities for understanding for our um, non-certificated employees. On the um, uh, new and easemic and seismic uh, in the sick leave, the a change in the sick leave bank, the change is really adding uh, an exchange component to it um, so that um, an employee who's in the sick leave bank may request from the sick leave bank, but if that's um, exhausted their, um, what they can get from there, then there could be an option to ask for volunteers to exchange. And then as the language goes through, it defines how that could happen and that the donor and whoever's receiving doesn't even need to be a part of the uh, sick leave bank. Um, so that keeps that process of keeping the sick leave bank and the exchange options, but uh, without undermining um, the sick leave bank, which has worked for us for a great number of years and helped serve our employees. In the area of leave, annual leave, uh, um, 12-month employees uh, are entitled to an, uh, annual leave to accumulate up to 55 days. And then <coughs> the um, second part of this is that uh, after they reach the 55 days, if they have more than that, uh, they had rolled over to sick leave. This provides an option of selling back um, three days uh, per year uh, starting in 1516 so it has no cost in this current year to us uh, and then it goes through um, that this is has to be requested by the employee by September the 15th um, once that's done the balances are based on the September 30th of how much uh, annual leave is there and then the 
request is either, either honored to um, pay three days if they're available, or they'll go to the sick leave, um, to their um, uh, sick leave. Uh, and then in the second paycheck in October is when those three days, um, excuse me, a, a second, uh, yeah, second paycheck in October is when they'd be paid out. The other thing under annual leave is just wording that um, uh, there shall be five day work days um, for a supervisor to respond to a request for annual leave. <coughs> Excuse me. In the bereavement area, what's in the red is uh, already in the contract. Um, what was added was the, uh, um, for other than the parent um, of the employee adopted for a uh, foster or a natural child, if the parent is not the employee's spouse, then, then the opportunity for, um, for them to have um, leave as well and uh, for bereavement. Um, and the two things there, 8.4A and um, or 8.41 in the two different contracts, that addresses the spouse already. So this is um, other than the spouse. And these things of that nature, it's, it's almost hard to cover and think of all the different relationships and things. And um, as experience happens, um, we try to make sure we cover those and all. Um, uh, new and easement, um, the course tuition, um, uh, under course tuition, there is the current uh, COMAR regarding um, certification of employees if they're 55 years of age and um, 25 years with the service, um, then this exempts them. Um, there's discussion at times that this may go away, but at this time it's currently um, still in place. And then <clears throat> under employee protection, um, everything in red again is the current language. Um, what was added mm -hmm. is um, not otherwise covered by the employee's homeowner's insurance. Uh, the school system will pay up to $600, and that was previously uh, $300. Um, and when that was placed there, um, it was looking at deductibles on, with on the, um, the homeowner's insurance and all. And um, this uh, needed to be clarified and taken care of because it had been shared with employees, and I know that this came up as part of the um, Spring Ridge fire and, and the loss of um, personal items at that, that location. Uh, <clears throat> new for seismic, but in uh, easemic um, is maternity leave, uh, requesting the process for doing that and, and walking through that uh, is all there. It also talks about uh, the return to the workplace and um, that they may not be back at the exact site, same site and things, and the requirement to notify when you're going to go out, but also when you're coming back, so that would allow some time to um, be able to do the placement uh, as best we can. So those are um, uh, part of seismic as well. Um, and then in the last bullet there, and mainly just indicates that, um, you know, that leave, um, you can, you know, it has to, uh, would, your leave would stay in aban abandons until uh, you return from uh, to active service. Uh, se um, severance um, and easement. Um, what was there before is what's in the basically in the um, dark letters, not shaded. And we had worked uh, previously with the other association um, to try to help give incentive to uh, accumulating sick leave and not using sick leave. So. Um, two things were added. Your years of service would help provide you um, an increase. And then also the amount of sick leave uh, balance that you are carrying. So there's two levels there. Again, trying to help people do two things, stay with us longer and also um, maintain their um, leave, uh, their sick leave. And so this brings um, that one in compliance with the uh, other association. And then in seismic, um, the uh, first two lines were also there as well. Not, it's not all new. But um, 
doing the same type of thing for the, the non-exempt employees, that would be our employees um, who are entitled to overtime and everything, and then our <coughs> exempt employees in the seismic contract um, having that option as well. Uh, promotion, this again is um, what we're doing, but it's uh, documented. Um, and you can see that uh, if there's a 10 and 11 month employee, their salary is calculated um, based on a monthly and then um, calculated out to the new uh, 12 month position or 11 if it's going from a 10 to 11. Um, to that position and then it's placed on the salary scale uh, at the next highest plus one and that's all of that is within our current practice. Um, negotiating procedures, this is uh, talking about impasse and um, before uh, there was language in there about going to the state superintendent and everything but since the Labor Relation Board um, has been in place, the, pro the process is here, so just updating the document to reflect what the current practice is. And then um, there is a provision within the contracts for joint studies, if both sides agree on. Um, two things that came up is videotaping within the school and trying to make sure that uh, so the committee would get together and talk about some of those parameters and understanding those as you, as an earlier one, um, if something happens, everybody's pumping out their phones and, and videotaping and things. Um, there are privacy things that has to be pr provided for. So this committee would talk about some of those and maybe bring back some language um, to be incorporated into the contract. Um, the other one is information technology, training and initiatives and inclusion. Um, this is one that uh, both sides would, again, talk about if there's something to come back. Uh, and uh, Mr. Smith and myself and Mr. Howard have had discussions of um, maybe establishing an advisory, technology advisory that would help overlook hardware, software, and everything so that we have an understanding of everything that's going on and maybe help guidance on those as well. And, um, that's besides this, but this could help play into that as well. So that concludes the uh, major changes um, to the FY15 contract <coughs> for easement and seismic. So any questions? Um, and then Ms. Luskin would be more than happy to answer, <laughs> as well as myself. <laughs> Sarita, do you have anything? Um, just about the part where you're talking about the videotaping, um, does that extend into just like taking pictures in general as well, or is that exclusively like taking videos? It, it's 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 addressing mainly videotaping mm -hmm. there um, of things and all, yes. But as we talk in that committee, looking at videotaping pictures and all. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Crosby. It's fine as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you for keeping us up to date on the continual negotiations, and so therefore I don't have any questions, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hats off to all of you. I guess you don't realize all of the details, you know, I've, I've read through, and thank you for clarifying the, the staff, uh, the staff meetings before on Fridays and before a holiday because I read through there I'm like man who would do that so <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> I'm like whoa so um, uh, well we got in trouble for having a PTA meeting on a Friday so I can relate um, but I but thank you thank you for all the attention the detail and another item that I guess I didn't think of you know because my kids are just in elementary school is all of the cell phones and the videotaping and the and the pictures and things like that so um, you know I, lo I look forward to the next contract that comes forward too <laughs> so <laughs> Mrs. Washington. <laughs> Great. I want to thank the chief negotiator, Mr. Clements, both easemic and seismic, included but not limited to Liz Purcell, Peg Johnson, Anna Laughlin, Faith Abernathy, Mr. O'Mealy, and everyone else involved in this collaborative effort and this, I call it the collaborative spirit <laughs> for working out a negotiated agreement over the last 14 months. Probably 14 to 18, yeah. 14 to yeah. 18 months. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the work and effort. Thank you. Mrs. Allen? 
There is a lot of effort put into it, and we recognize that and appreciate that you are willing to sit down and have the conversation and to make it a, um, a civil and respectful conversation. Um, we're very fortunate in St. Mary's County because that does not happen across the state. And um, it is a testimony to the professionalism <coughs> of our staff um, across the board who, uh, who function in the way that you do and, um, and have the dedication and the loyalty to bring this forward. Thank you very much for, for all of it. Okay. Anything else? I'd just like to say we are a, um, we are a system where the majority of our, 80% of our budget goes to people. We are about people and how we treat people defines who we are. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, contributions and Ms. Laughlin for your comments. Uh, at the beginning of the session, I, I, I hope that I hope that everybody's listening. I really, really do. Thank you. Okay. With that being said, I would like a motion. I move that the Board of Education approve the negotiated agreements reached between St. Mary's County Public Schools and the Education Association of St. Mary's County and St. Mary's County Public Schools and the Collective Education Association of St. Mary's County for July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2017 with openers as called for under the duration article. Do I have Aye. a second? I second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you, uh, before you do your information items, you would you like to sign now at this time or, or after at the end? That, that would probably yeah, be. Yeah, the, since they have been sitting here for. And <laughs> out of respect for those who yes. have joined us yes. and are eager to use their pens, that would be. Yes. Okay. Would be preferred. Right. Another 10 minute break, guys. <laughs> no crowns. No crowns coming. I've never sued anybody. All right, I'm reconvening. I think we didn't the meeting. To sue people. Oh, we don't have Kathy. Sorry, we're still reconvening. I've lost her. Hmm. Talk amongst yourselves. Compulsory. <laughs> They were on that last year. I thought she was sitting there. Mm -hmm. God, these are dirty. We lost them. <laughs> Sorry, it's my fault. I didn't know you were gone. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, you're right parallel with Mary, so it's, you know, you guys just all blend together. all three. vision is. <laughs> okay. All right, Maryland State Compulsory Attendance, Dr. Ridgel. Good morning. Good morning. As a result of Senate Bill 362 passed by the Maryland General Assembly and Governor in 2012, the Maryland State Compulsory Attendance Laws are changing. The easiest way to look at this is in terms of, of the years the compulsory attendance starting age is still five years old. That part has not changed as a result of the Senate bill. What changed was the ending age for compulsory attendance, and that is more commonly referred to as the age in which students can drop out of school. Uh, the current school year, as it has been for many years, students have to be 16. Next year, as a result of that change in the law passed by the General Assembly and Governor, the dropout age will then be age 17. Students will be required to attend school to that point of, of becoming 17. That is also true for the 2016-2017 school year. That same law then changes the dropout age in 2017 to 2018 school year to age 18. So as the law then reads, beginning with 2015-2016 school year, next year, every child who resides in Maryland and is five years or older and under 17 shall attend a public school regularly unless the child is elsewhere receiving regular instruction 
in the studies taught in the public schools to children of the same, same age. This would apply to students who turn age 16 on or after July 1 of 2015. The compulsory attendance law is based on public school attendance. So that's why it references unless the child is elsewhere receiving regular instruction. So all students attending um, non-public schools, uh, students who are in the home instruction program and so forth um, come under the compulsory attendance. Then beginning with the 17-18 school year, every child who resides in Maryland in its five years or older and under age 18 shall attend a public school regularly, again, unless the child is elsewhere receiving regular instruction in the studies taught in the public schools to children of the same age. That would apply to students who turn age 17 on or after July 1, 2017. With our graduation rate uh, in, for 2014 being 93.46 percent, you can tell that this is not a large number of students in terms of our school system. Uh, the dropout rate for 2004 was 4.4 percent. Uh, so every single student matters, but this certainly is a small number of students that that normally perhaps would have dropped out at age 16 that we will be able to work with now since next year it changes to that age 17. And, and just to clarify, Dr. Ridgell, that 4.4 percent is the cohort dropout rate. So it's 4.4 uh, percent of all the children in grades 9, 10, 11, and 12 for last year's cohort dropped out of school. So it could be 1 percent one year, 1 percent one year, 1 percent one year, 1 percent one year, but 4.4 overall for four years. So we've met with the principals, the assistant principals, counselors, people, personnel workers since this law actually was passed in 2012. So we do know it has been coming. Uh, we have certainly been publishing it in the student handbook and also that students and parents would have that as well. It appears on the school system's website. Uh, we do have a press release that we have prepared that can be issued after the meeting today and all to be able to, to explain it in additionally. And certainly when you look at all the interventions and things that the school system has been putting in place over the last few years to be able to um, keep students in school, students to be able to be successful in that respect. Uh, currently, about half of the states in the nation has already made the change to 17 and 18. Uh, as far as our neighboring states, Delaware and West Virginia are still at age 16. Mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania is 17, Virginia and District of Columbia are already age 18. Any questions? Serena? Um. Oh, I just learned I can drop out of school for <laughs> No, no questions. You just what? I just learned I can drop out of school now. Yeah, oh. I, I believe your parents would have a different opinion, <laughs> as would the entire board <laughs> and the secretary treasurer. I, it's good to know. Do we have, and, if you, and I'm sure you've thought about it, um, a lot of these kids are going to be kids that have, we know right now that we have a lot of children throughout the entire country that need skills um, other than college type skills, is that a way of putting it? And we don't have enough technical centers and that type of thing. Are we going to be able to meet the needs, that's my question, of all of these children, which you said isn't really many, who um, can't drop out. We'll have a truant officer on them. <laughs> well, they, we will. I, I believe we can, Mrs. Crosby. Uh, when you look at, for example, like Fairlead 1, Fairlead yes, that's 2, what I was thinking. when you look at the latest in terms of APEX and students being able to retake courses. But we have and thought all that. Being out, able I'm to sure. do it all mm -hmm. online. I mean, mm -hmm. those kinds of initiatives. Go to CSM. That's another Correct. One. 
will mm -hmm. really help students to be successful. That's the main and thing. And it is a small number right now that we're working with. Okay, just checking. And we'll keep that, uh, some kind of graph that shows that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a question on, I know that um, you have the must be 18, you know, when it eventually gets there. Is there a cutoff age that, you know, the student is now like 19 or maybe even 20? And I'm not talking the students that are in special ed, but, you know, mm -hmm. that you have a cutoff time that you need to have that, you know, graduation requirements done by. 21. It's for every, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Okay. That's my question. Thank you. Now, of course, if you graduate and get your diploma before you're 18, you can. It's okay to come out of school. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, we, we, that's a, that is a substantially growing number over mm -hmm. time. Over the last five years, we have many more students who are accelerating their path through high school and graduating at 16 and a half years old and entering college and post-secondary opportunities at 17. Ha is CSM a four-year college yet? No. That's what we're going to have to have. But they have multiple articulated programs with the University of Maryland and Southern Maryland Higher Ed Center. Um, that, uh, so it's a fantastic uh, beginning oh, if you are pursuing uh, have to 204. Have mm -hmm. Mrs. Washington. I think that age 16 was much too young for a student to make an adult decision to drop out of school. And that decision would have had long-term negative consequences throughout that person's life. So I, I appreciate this decision that the age was changed. And I, we at St. Mary's County Public School believe all students can and, and will, will learn. Absolutely. And we have strategies mm -hmm. and interventions in place to help mm -hmm. all students. And we try to meet the need of each individual student one by one. So um, I applaud this. And uh, students need to stay in school, and we need to help them so that they can realize their dreams to become productive members of society and be contributing members and citizens, of course, with good character. Thank you so much. Mrs. Allen? Reinforcing the belief of the board that um, students need to stay in school and, um, and that we need to help them be successful. We put those interventions in place mm -hmm. um, before this law was ever even discussed. Um, and I think we are proving how successful those things are. Um, it's, it's not enough just to tell a child, you cannot drop out, you're going to have to stay. If, um, if they're not successful, uh, then there's all kinds of trouble they can get into to just try to to prove that they're in the wrong place, that they, they don't want to be there and they're not going to be. Um, so I, I applaud those who um, continue to work with and, and help them as they, um, as they work to achieve the success. Um, you've said you know, that there's not um, a lot of students who fall under this, but um, it's one thing for the legislature to say that they cannot drop out, but if they decide they're going to, what, what consequence is there? If they leave school bef b without graduating and before the age of 17 and then 18. Currently, it would go back, as, as Mrs. Crosby had mentioned, they would come under the habitual truancy laws. That's what I thought, but I just wanted you to clarify We would that have to proceed, and ultimately, of course, if a student is not attending school, mm -hmm. And we cannot determine a valid lawful reason as defined by the state for a student to attend school. Then ultimately the law requires me to send the information to the state's attorney's office for St. Mary's County for them to consider prosecution. Got it. And keeping in mind that the current Maryland state standard for habitual truancy has to be less than 1%. So the state is saying that with the full passage of this and its fruition in 2017 or 18, their expectation is a 99% graduation rate for all schools in the state of Maryland. Mm -hmm. 
Um, may I say something, Mr. Smith? That would be quite it. We would be very proud um, of that. I agree that uh, we need our graduation rate is going up. That's wonderful. All right. Now, also, though, we have a little problem. There are kids over there at CSM that are having to take remedial courses. Aren't we got to cut down? How do you know a anything about that? I, I've learned about that through talking to Charlie Walsh, is one person that told me. And um, I don't know who these kids are, but um, I assume that some of them came from our school. Do you know? Students, when they enroll into CSM, do yes. take a placement course. They're taking one. The placement course at CSM yes. determines their starting point of courses in the English and math areas. Yes. And sometimes CSM decides that they would be better served by taking a sort of a review kind of course, mm -hmm. and they begin there and move forward. I just think that we need to make sure that our children have the skills not to not have to go th through those remedial, I'm using that word, courses. Because that will come up with all of this. That's all. It's one of the reasons that um, the, with the Maryland State Curriculum um, that it's articulated not just within K-12, but um, K beyond. No, K it's 16. K-16. Yes. Right. It is, in a, it is a, a direct measure to, um, to address just that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ms. Tammy McCord. Oh, I missed her. I missed her. March 2015 financial report. Liars, figures, lion, liars, figures. Mm -hmm. Here's some cards with me. You see how it's just wrong? He just needs to. As of March 31st, on the revenue side, we have received $136.9 million of the $195 million budget. All items are tracking on as expected. On the expenditure side, once again, the area of uh, noted concern is special education. We have $152,000 unobligated as of the end of March. However, as of today, we have $54,000 unobligated. So we're looking at year-end projections, and on all likelihood, we'll be um, proposing a budget adjustment to you in the very near future. I would like to point out, though, uh, to you for the special education transfers line, if you look at that line, that $1.8 million year-to-date includes year-to-date encumbrances. So we currently have encumbrances included in that line of $765,000. And our balance is currently at $184.8 million to include all salary and other purchase order encumbrances currently out there against the $195 million budget. Are there any specific questions? Sarita? No, no questions. Thank you. Mrs. Crosby? <coughs> Every t I've been here now seven years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyway, it's all the special education, but I know how expensive that is, especially if we send children out of county. Are we still sending a lot out of county, Mrs. Uh, McCourt? We are still sending some children out of county, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I don't have the exact numbers, though. And I know of cases that where children are being served within the county in a very creative ways, and they're being served probably better than if they were sent out of county. And we, I'm not criticizing you at all. And we need to investigate those ways, because I know some of them, and give them to other children, too, you know. And we might not save anything, but we won't be in any more of a hole than we are now. Just a suggestion. Thank you for all your work. Ms. Tamira? Okay. And I know that I had asked these questions previously, and I was provided an answer. Thank you very much. It was on, uh, I did not understand about the transferring of funds for state award books. I was provided an answer. I'm not sure if that was Dr. Moore that provided that um, answer. Dr. Or Moore, Regina Greeley, um, 
working through the, the specific text that, that would fall into the category of state award. Right, and I, I did not understand what that was, so I asked for clarification. I was provided clarification what mm -hmm. uh, state award books were, and thank you very much. And also I had asked about the funds um, moving for, uh, from one area from instructional textbooks to another area for new teachers, and that was, um, thank you, whoever provided me this Mar. answer Dr. Mar. for, <laughs> it was who? Dr. Dr. Mar. Oh, oh I, I would yes. say thank you, Dr. Mar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even though he is not here, he had uh, said that it was for the new teacher orientation to, for a seminar um, and that was held at the uh, Forest, Center. Forest, Forest Center. Center. So I just had questions on that and those answers were provided for me earlier by Dr. Mar. Mrs. Washington? No questions, thank you very much. Mrs. Allen? Um, maintenance of plant, the uh, contracted services, can you speak to that oh, one? Yes, um, I'm sorry. Because it's not, it, it isn't detailed below, or at least not. We are currently in the process of um, performing a budget adjustments from the supplies and materials uh, accounts to contracted services. Okay, um, and the questions that I had posed earlier were the, uh, with respect to the, um, the budget adjustments that uh, the safety and security assistant that's being provided at Leonardtown High School for the remainder of the year, and then also the um, uh, evening, the one-on-one -on -one evening counselor uh, psychologist. Um, and, it's, and it's just a, it's the continuation of the program at, at one of the sites. And for the safety and security advocates, it's to f it's to fill in for a, uh, a person who is out for uh, an extended period of time for the remainder. Year. And so we are still maintaining, as we are obligated, and we of course would want to do that employee and their benefit and their salary, um, but we do need the need within the system for a, a person, an actual physical person, to be at the school. And I appreciate that um, clarification, that understanding. It, it helps me to know if this was um, expected, unexpected, and, and um, or if it's, if it's above and beyond what we're already providing. So I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank Thank you. Okay. And that brings us to the end. The next board meeting will be on Wednesday, April 29th. It is an evening meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. we are adjourned. Thanks very much. Good job. I just need to. Yeah.